Today is the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, the commemoration of the first Sunday of the Pentecost. Epistle from St. Paul the Apostle to the Romans. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God, how incomprehensible are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and recompense shall made him, shall be made him? For of him and by him and in him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Going therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days even to the consummation of the world. Please be seated. Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. 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 The Athanasian Creed and the Creed of Pope Pius IV, also called the Tridentine Creed. And as a primary note, the Creed of Paul VI, which is known as the Credo of the People of God, composed in the year 1968 after Vatican II, is not authentically Catholic because it contained heresies, and therefore it should be rejected. Why does the Catholic Church have four approved creeds? In today's Gospel, we have heard our Lord's command to the Apostles. Going therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. As the dogmatic theology for a lady explains, every individual is obligated under the pain of grave sin to accept the Catholic faith as soon as this faith becomes known to him. Christ himself expressly states this in St. Mark 16, 15, and so on, when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Christ could not make a more explicit statement of the serious obligation upon all men of all times to believe in him. This faith is a prerequisite for salvation for every human being. As St. Augustine puts it in a short sentence, he said, if a man refuses to walk in faith here on earth, he will not arrive at vision of God in heaven. Religious indifferentism is thus a treacherous and a dangerous thing when it claims that it makes no difference what a man believes so long as he lives a good life. Or as the king of Prussia, Frederick II, put it once, he said, let each man believe exactly what he wants. But this is a direct contradiction of Christ's command when he said, He that believeth not shall be condemned. And also our Lord says, He that is not with me is against me.
The basic reasons behind religious indifferentism can be various. It can result from the influence of, of the environment, family, society, from spiritual sloth, thoughtlessness, from lack of decision and courage, from weak character, from cowardly hesitation in the face of a final decision, and so on and so on. Nevertheless, fundamentally, this is the full truth. Only a man who believes in Christ can have eternal happiness. Faith is the foundation of all Catholic living. Or as the Council of Trent puts it, quote, faith is a root of justification. Heaven must be merited by means of good works, but good works are meritorious, meritorious only when they proceed from true faith. As St. Paul says in his epistle, the just man liveth by faith. Convinced of the grave necessity of our faith, one must be prepared to accept all the teachings which God has revealed. Since the same God with the, with the, same, with the same attributes, that is, with all truthfulness and all knowledge, who vouches for each and every article of faith, we must accept them all without reservation. It would be a sin of heresy to pick and choose among them or to, choose, to accept only those which seem appropriate to us. Denying even one of the divine teachings is equivalent to denying them all, because the ground for accepting all of them is the same authority of God. Nonetheless, there are still many revealed truths that even a trained theologian can hardly be expected to know them all. And not all of them are equally important for our practical living. Therefore, from the very beginning of Christianity, the infallible church herself, who is alone responsible and capable of such an undertaking, reduced the most important divine teachings and events of salvation, which every Catholic must know and explicitly confess to a schematic outline, a sort of prayer formula, called the creed. The oldest of these creeds is called the Apostles' Creed becomes, because it goes back to the times of the Apostles. As the Catechism of Trent, Council of Trent, summarized its origin, quote, Now the three truths which Christians ought to hold are those which the Holy Apostles, the leaders and teachers of the faith, inspired by the Holy Ghost, have divided into twelve articles of the Creed. For having received a command from the Lord to go forth into the whole world as his ambassadors and preach the gospel to every creature, they thought it advisable to draw up a formula of Christian faith that all might think and speak the same thing. End of quote. The next creed in the history of the church is the Nicene Creed. It was first promulgated at the Council of Nicaea 325, though in abbreviated format, which we have below. And later on in the Council, the, in the Council of Constantinople, it was then made some additions according to the heresy that rose from that period. Basically, it came about from two heresies. These two councils solved the question of the true nature of Jesus Christ. The true nature of Jesus was defended against two heresies that had sprung up, the Arians denied Christ's divinity, and the Monophysites denied Christ's humanity. The Council drawing up the traditions handed down to them from the Apostles, condemned both heresies, and then clarified the teachings in more explicit language, and that's why the Nicene Creed is a bit longer than the Apostles' Creed. And this Nicene Creed, also called the Nicene Constantinople Creed, is what we pray at Holy Mass. The Athanasian Creed comes from, believed to come from the great doctor of the church, father of the church, St. Athanasius. And it was first found in existence in the year 542. It is, it particularly emphasizes the doctrine of the Trinity, and that is why Priests, Christian priests nowadays pray it 
in the office of prime on this Sunday. And in the old days, every Sunday for prime, the priest used to pray. It goes like this. Whosoever will be saved before all things is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled. Without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither compounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For this one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal and the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Ghost uncreated. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal, and yet they are, they are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there are not three uncreated, nor three incomprehens incomprehensibles, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So likewise the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, and the Holy Ghost Almighty, and yet they are not three Almighties, but one, one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, and yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord, and yet they not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord, so we, are we forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there be three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made not, nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity, none is afore or after other, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. So that in all things, as is aforesaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born into the world. Perfect God and perfect man, of a rational soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood. For although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. One, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, he sent into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He sent into heaven, he sitteth at the right, on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. At whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies, 
and shall give account for their own works. And they that have done good shall go into life everlasting, and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. End of the Athanasian Creed. And the fourth and last approved creed of the church is the creed of Pope Pius IV, also called the Tridentine Creed. It was issued on November 13, 1565 by Pope Pius IV in his bull called Inuctum Nobis under the auspices of the Council of Trent. And it was added to that after the first Vatican Council to, to accept the, doc, the definitions of that council. Major intent of the creed, of this fourth creed, was to clearly define the Catholic faith against the Protestant beliefs. And it is used by theologians as an oath of loyalty since then, and also even today, the traditional Catholic priests use it to bring converts into the Catholic faith. And the creed goes like this. Most firmly I admit and embrace the apostolic and ecclesiastical traditions and all the other constitutions and ordinances of the church. I admit the sacred scriptures in the sense which has been held and is still held by Holy Mother Church, whose duty it is to judge the true sense of the inter and interpretation of sacred scripture, and I shall never accept or inter 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 interpret them except according to unanimous consent of the fathers. I profess that the sacraments of the new law are truly and precisely seven in number, instituted for the salvation of mankind, though all are not necessary for each individual. Baptism, confirmation, holy Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, holy orders, and matrimony. I profess that all confer grace and that baptism confirmation and holy orders cannot be repeated without sacrilege. I also accept and admit the ritual of the Catholic Church in the solemn administration of all the sacraments mentioned above. I accept and hold each, in each and every part all that has been defined and declared by the Sacred Council of Trent concerning original sin and justification. I profess that in the Mass is offered to God a true, real, and propitiatory sacrifice for the living and the dead. That in the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, is really, truly, and substantially present. And that there takes place in the Mass what the Church calls transubstantiation which is the change of all the substance of the bread into the body of Christ and all the substance of the wine into his blood. I confess also that in receiving either of these species, one receives Jesus Christ whole and entire. I firmly hold that purgatory exists and that the souls detained therein can be helped by the prayers of the faithful. Likewise, I hold that the saints who reign with Jesus Christ should be venerated and invoked, that, that, that they offer prayers to God for us, and that their relics are to be venerated. I firmly profess that the images of Jesus Christ and of the Mother God, ever virgin, as well as all the saints, should be given due honor and veneration. I also affirm that Jesus Christ left to the church the faculty to grant indulgences and that their use is most salutary to the Christian people. I recognize the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church as the mother and teacher of all the churches, and I promise and swear true obedience to the Roman Pontiff, successor of St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, and vigor of Jesus Christ. Such is the creed, the credo of Pope Pius IV. Yeah. Sorry, there's still one more sentence. My mistake. Moreover, without hesitation, I accept and profess all that has been handed down, defined and declared by the sacred canons and by the general councils, especially by the sacred council of Trent 
and by the First Vatican General Council. In a special manner, all that concerns the primacy and infallibility of the Roman pontiff. At the same time, I condemn and reprove all that the church has condemned and reproved. The same Catholic faith outside of which none can be saved, I now freely profess, and to it I truly adhere. With the help of God, the same faith I promise and swear to maintain and profess entirely, inviolately, and with firm constancy until the last breath of life. And that is the last of this creed. Therefore, on this first Sunday after Pentecost and this feast of the Most Holy Trinity, let us give immeasurable thanks to the Most Holy Trinity for all their blessings, especially for giving us the true faith. Just why more people do not have the true faith is somewhat of an unfortunate fact in this life. which even Our Lady lamented once in her words to a venerable Sister Mary, Mother Mary of Ergida, in the well-known book, The Mystical City of God. And just as an aside, in the city, this Mystical City of God booklet, book, which in the English translation is four, four volumes, consists of the divine history and life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, manifested to venerable Sister Mary of Ergida in the 1600s, approved by many popes and bishops. And according to the decrees of Pope Innocent XI and Pope Clement XI, this book may be read by all the faithful. And even there's a report that even the great Pope, St. Pius X, used this yeah. book for some of his sermons. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what Our Lady told Sister, Venerable Sister Maria, right after Pentecost yeah. Sunday, why more people don't accept the true faith. Mm -hmm. Remember we told the Acts of the Apostles that 3,000 were converted at the first sermon of St. Peter. 3,000 out of how many? There were probably at least a million pilgrims in Jerusalem at that time. Mm -hmm. So the history of very few people accepting the truth is not just now in our great apostasy since Vatican II. So this is what Our Lady told her. My daughter, in what thou hast come to know of the events related in this chapter, thou wilt find a great deal that points to the mystery of the predestination of souls. Be convinced that since redemption was so overflowing and copious, it was sufficient for the salvation of all men. The divine truth was made known to all, whoever heard his preaching, or who saw the effects of the command, coming of the God man, God man into the world, besides the outward preaching and knowledge of the, of the remedy, all received interior inspirations and helps in order to seek and accept the means. You are surprised that in spite of all this, only 3,000 were converted by the first sermon of the apostle, among all that great multitude then in Jerusalem. It should cause a greater surprise that in our times, remember she's talking about the 1600s, so imagine what she would talk now in these times of the apostasy. That in our times, she said, are so few are converted to the way of eternal life. As the gospel is more widespread, its preaching is frequent, its ministers numerous, the light of the church clearer, and the knowledge of the divine mysteries are more definite. With all this, men are blinder, the hearts more hardened, pride more inflated, avarice more bold, and all the vices are practiced without fear of God and without consideration. In this most perverse and unhappy state, Mortals cannot complain of the most high and equitable providence of the Lord, who offers to all and everyone his fatherly mercy and points out to them both the way of life and the way of death, so that if any man hardens his heart, God can permit it in strictest justice. 
The reprobate will have none but themselves to blame. If afterwards, when there is no more time, they will they shall be uselessly dismayed with what it, opportune time they could and should have known. If in the short and transient life, which is given to them in order to merit the eternal, they close their eyes and ears to the truth and to the light, and if they listen to the demon, giving them themselves up to all the promptings of his malice, if they thus choose if they thus abuse the goodness and clemency of the Lord, what can they then allege as their excuse? If they do not know how to pardon an injury and for the slightest offense meditate the dire's vengeance, if for the sake of increasing their property they pervert the entire order of reason and of natural brotherhood, if, for a passing delight, they forget the eternal pains, and if, in addition to all this, they despise the warnings, the helps, and admonitions sent to them by God to inspire them with the fear of perdition and induce them to avoid, to avoid it, how shall they afterwards find fault with the divine clemency? Let then mortals who have sinned against God undeceive themselves. Without penance, there shall be no grace. Without reform, no pardon. Without pardon, no glory. But just as these are not conceded to those that are unworthy, so they are also never denied to those that are worthy. Nor is ever the mercy of God without withheld from anyone who seeks to obtain it. Immaculate Mary, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.